Thank you for coming um, again to the fourth in this series, which is an exploration of the idea of the city of the future and New York as the definition of the future in the 1920s and into the early 1930s. Um, of all of these inventors of a modern um, American architecture, the Hood um, is the one who is both most um, creative uh, and, um, and I think, um, um, to some extent the most celebrated, but also at the same time the most um, misunderstood. And I'll argue um, that it's really through the skyscraper that you can understand Hood's career. Hood had personality in, in great measure. He was described by um, all who, um, who both um, enjoyed his uh, company but all, and on those um, who also um, were skeptical of his talents as someone who was, um, and it's the title of the lecture tonight, the brilliant bad boy of New York architecture. Hood was born in 1881 um, and he, uh, he died prematurely in 1934, so at the age of 53 when he was really at the, at the height of his powers and would have been most particularly um, at the height of his, his architectural creativity had he not been, uh, had he not died in the early years of, of the depression when um, architectural commissions were, were few and far between. It was um, in, in five skyscrapers that he designed during his career that I think you can best see um, Hood's creativity and also this, this brilliance that was so commented upon um, by his contemporaries. S.J. Wolfe uh, fused about Hood um, and his, uh, his um, what is sort of dynamic personality, uh, as well as his, his business acumen, that um, that Hood has reared no temples to dead gods. He has built workshops for living men, and in their construction, he proclaimed the era of business, of machinery and speed. The word that you hear besides um, besides business and commercial um, with Raymond Hood uh, is is speed, and this idea that they're always racing around, they're revving up. Um, they drove their cars fast. Um, in fact, um, Hood uh, um, had a car crash. Um, I learned from Dan Oakrand and, and broke his arm, <laughs> and it was in, in a sling for. Um, Part of the time, I think it was just before one of his major commissions. So um, the, you just have the, the idea that the Roaring Twenties were really defined um, by, uh, especially uh, by Raymond Hood, but by this group of architects um, who, who clearly were making, were amusing themselves as well as the word, world with this new architecture they were creating. And then, can I have, um, can, we, can we go forward? I hope that's there. Yeah. So here he is, um, Raymond Hood, in um, in his uh, probably late forties, uh, is penetrating eyes and his characteristic crew cut. Uh, the next please. And we'll look at these five buildings, the five skyscrapers that through which I think um, you can define you can best define Hood's career because uh, if you look at the scholarship on Hood of, of um, academics who have written monographs are incorporated uh, his work into a, a broad sweep of the 1920s, most of those people seem to be sort of either confused or ambivalent about um, Hood's career. And there, um, I, I suppose the, the greatest enthusiast for Hood uh, is, is Rem Koolhaas of the Office of Metropolitan Architecture in his great, great book, the, um, Delirious New York, who, who um, celebrates Hood um, as a, a um, uh, someone who was uh, inherent had an inherent um, contradiction, uh, but who characterized what F. Scott Fitzgerald um, sort of defined as the litmus test of a, of a great intellectual, and that is um, someone who was able to hold two opposing thoughts in his mind and in his his, his, his activities and his creative character at the same time, uh, and. Um, if I find that particular, too many markers here, but uh, but but that idea of um, of a contradiction of styles uh, is is very uh, clear is, is, is very troubling across Hood's whole career. We're only going to really look at the skyscrapers. Even within the skyscrapers you see from the gothic style of the Chicago Tribune, um, the next place, 
uh, to the somewhat um, gothic character of this early modern work, the American Radiator or American Standard Building on Bryant Park, 40, 40 uh, West 40th Street, or the next one um, to, uh, to the dramatically different uh, Daily News building of about 1929, 1930, with its um, extreme verticality, its bold striping, its truncated top, and this carved um, form where it's where it's just sliced off, as if sliced in section. Um, and the next place uh, to the um, the McGraw Hill building on West 42nd Street where, as you'll see later, the green terracotta tile breaks completely with any tradition of, of um, contemporary or certainly um, historical architecture. So it's, it's clad in a green skin and you can see it here glinting in the sun but with, the, with the, these sharp simple lines. Uh, to, and to the next or the last of the five great towers, uh, the RCA building, the centerpiece of Rockefeller Center. And these um, dramatically different in the choice of ornament in their style, in their in, in the style that in which they are decorated is the wrong word, but but styli stylistically expressed. What they sh what they what they share is this fundamental idea um, that you see throughout Hood's um, career, and it's, it's the idée fixe of his, of his architectural um, practice, uh, is uh, the idea of the tower. Raymond Hood loved towers, and in this he's, he's utterly different than his good friends Ralph Walker or um, uh, Elijah Khan, where the setback, the pyramidal, ziggurat type, typical form that, as we've seen in previous talks, is absolutely established um, almost irreversibly by the zoning law, the 1916 zoning law in New York. But Hood overcomes this. He, through his creativity and through his, um, his keen business sense, where he comes to terms with his clients um, in a kind of wily debate where he's always out, out sort of one step ahead in thinking about how he's going to convince them to build his building instead of you know their their budget, um, Hood is is as brilliant a businessman uh, in his creativity as uh, he is an architect with this wide range of expression, um, always with the idea of creating a tower, and that's what we're going to explore um, through the the um, slides in, in the lecture this evening. Yep. So so this is just a, a slide that. Um, underscores the sort of theoretical uh, impulse uh, in much of his work um, where he tries to create the tower form. And indeed, he tries to reinvent New York as a city of towers, not a city of setback um, uh, super blocks or, um, or, or colossal um, setbacks, uh, skyscrapers. The next, please. And that's what we're going to explore. Uh, this is a, a model that we recreated in that uh, case in the exhibition that was uh, a plasticine model that illustrated in 3D the same investigation that you saw in that in that last sketch, which was by Hood's in Hood's hand. Uh, this is a model that actually sat on Hood's desk in his architectural practice. And when a client would come in and say, you know, I want to build a skyscraper, let's discuss it, he would show them this model and say, you can do this. Uh, you, you know, no need to make that ziggurat. No, no, no need to do uh, an Eli Jacques Kahn sort of decorated wedding cake uh, uh, setback. Um, create a tower form. The next, please. Now, this inclination towards towers goes all the way back to his um, first works as an architect. Uh, this is his diploma uh, um, uh, prize, or his, his, his diploma uh, thesis at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts uh, from 1911, and it's for a municipal building in Providence, uh, Rhode Island. He was born in Pawtucket uh, of um, quite a very well-to-do parents. He had attended MIT and uh, graduated in 1903 uh, with a, a, a Bachelor's of Science. He was interested in architecture. He decided to follow the same route that any um, would-be successful um, architect uh, would follow, is that, that is uh, to go to Paris to study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. He spent eight years there in Paris and sort of coming back and forth. Uh, uh, 
a number of people have, have written about how, with great amusement how he uh, arrived very straight-laced and um, never drank wine and, um, and d denounced uh, um, every, any kind of bawdy kind of, of behavior. And by the time he left, he was, he was the Raymond Hood of which uh, you know, the lifestyle was, uh, was so admired uh, or, uh, by, uh, by, the, by the people who uh, mentioned his speed and his friends at the, at the drinking clubs. Uh, so he, uh, he liberated himself during these times at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts uh, and he held the Beaux-Arts principles close uh, in, the re in the remainder of his, his years of practice and we'll see this sort of play between history and, um, and planning uh, in, in his other work but you can see that the attenuated tower is already something uh, which is going to be the leitmotif um, of his, uh, his visionary work and, and his his um, sort of aspirations uh, to build monumental architecture. Uh, those will be satisfied through the commercial architecture of the skyscraper. The next place. Uh, and this is what he looked like as a young man with his bow tie as he was studying in Paris um, in a daguerreotype um, kind of photograph. Uh, with his, his short cropped hair but all the accoutrements of the young artist um, uh, surrounding him and looks pensive and uh, and uh, creative. Uh, the next please. Uh, and, and, and this, although he's not in this picture, some of his good friends are, uh, is the uh, sort of lineage of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in America. It's the Americanization and commercialization of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. This happens to be the, the famous photograph of the 1931 Beaux-Arts Ball, which was a tradition um, that every year was, uh, was organized by the, the members of the, the alumni of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts the, the Beaux Institute of Design so, uh, he, here in New York. And uh, graduates uh, belonged to that club and every year they put on, as was the practice in Paris, a great ball which was usually a masquerade ball and, the one in, and usually these were sort of romantic, the Arabian Nights or you know, some kind of Orientalism, exoticism, uh, but modernism was the topic of, of 1931 and of course that's um, William Van Allen in the center as this Chrysler building and all the other architects and here's Eli Jacques Kahn uh, dressed up as their buildings and Hood um, unusually uh, enough you know, isn't in this lineup but he was one of the, the regular committee members um, in the uh, organization of these FETs. The next please. So the Ecole des Beaux-Arts is a, a place that he trained and he was very uh, active in uh, architectural organizations uh, like the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design. Uh, he designed on, uh, on uh, East 44th Street, I think, um, the uh, Beaux-Arts apartments, which are right next to, which would be right here on the street, the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design's headquarters um, in New York. So he remained very much a sort of a, a party, uh, party man and party liner uh, with the <laughs> traditions of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. The next place, we'll look again at this building. Um, but it, it, uh, that, those years in between 1911, his uh, graduation and his return to the U.S., and then the series of offices that he worked in, not um, only in New York, but uh, in Boston for uh, um, Cram, Goodhue, and Ferguson, uh, then in uh, Pittsburgh for Henry Hornbostel, and in between in another, uh, another Hornbostel uh, firm, and uh, then coming to New York to settle uh, in a small office where he hustled small jobs and they were indeed very small where he practiced with a friend, Rain Adams. Uh, and they left, uh, Rain Adams wrote a number of accounts about their struggles as, as young architects and how they had practically no commissions and uh, but Hood, uh, even when some uh, rich socialite came on occasion to ask him to do some kind of renovation, a bathroom or whatever, um, he would always uh, in a very, he would never capitalize on the opportunity, uh, but uh, would would keep would measure his uh, ambitions to the particular assignment of, of that room. And one time, so famously, uh, a woman uh, came and said, "There's a crack in the in the in my, my my bathroom, and you know I want an architect to fix it." He said, "Just just put, just hang a um, a picture frame over it." So, <laughs> so he was he was almost notoriously self-effacing, um, and 
and unambitious um, during these years um, in practice, but he had declared when he came to New York that he, that he moved to New York to become New York's most famous architect, and, and indeed he, he did become that. Um, but he was struggling through the years of the teens um, and through the early 20s until in just in the early 1922, uh, he was well known in architectural circles he, as a very good draftsman. He, uh, he uh, studied at the atelier. He ha had these uh, um, sort of colleagues and associates uh, um, who were who were all struggling together, but were a little bit more successful than he was. So he was known in the architectural community, and the, the story goes that uh, when the Chicago Tribune competition was announced in 1922, uh, that, of course, this was, and we've talked about it a number of times before, this was the most spectacular opportunity for architects. It was the most publicized and promoted of architectural events. Uh, and the new headquarters building that was promised as a commission uh, to the winner of the competition um, was uh, also carried prize money of uh, a $50,000 first prize and then $20,000, $10,000 and, um, and some sort of honorable mention uh, runners up fees. Uh, so, so a lot of people comp competed. In fact, to over 260 different architects competed. But there were a few invited participants, and one of them was John Mead Howells, who was uh, a, a fairly conservative, again, Beaux-Arts trained uh, New York architect, uh, who was distantly related, or was a cousin of uh, the leadership of the um, McCormick's uh, of the Chicago Tribune, uh, and he was one of the invited participants. And the story goes that he was in, he, he was way too busy with his own work. He needed somebody to collaborate with him. He bumped into Raymond Hood in Grand Central as he was um, thinking about, oh, you know, how am I going to manage everything, and invited Hood in order to participate and, and uh, and to do the drawings for, uh, to develop the design. They were later credited as collaborators rather than, um, than simply as you know, an employee, um, an assistant uh, to uh, John Mead House. But lo and behold, they did win the competition. Uh, with this design that we've seen before of a Gothic tower that's modeled on the details in terms of the ornament of the Butter Tower uh, in Rouen, so French Gothic style. Uh, but but with a, a kind of, uh, of emphatic verticality and a, a very clean organization of the fenestration and the, the lighting system that was necessary for a modern um, skyscraper to illuminate the interior, uh, and with an idea about the tower being one thing. And um, that's something that I'd like to read a little bit uh, about uh, who, what could um, wrote at the time, very close to the time, about their design because I think it helps to establish this idea of the search for, uh, for a, a tower form which was strident, which was simplified, and which was, as he talks about it, is all one thing. So um, describing their intention, so Hood, um, Hood uh, stated, we feel that in this design we have produced a unit. It is not a tower or a top um, or a top placed on a building. It's all one building. It climbs into the air naturally, carrying its main structural lines and binding them together with a high open parapet. Our desire has been not so much to secure an archaeological expression of any particular style as to express on the exterior the essentially American problem of skyscraper construction with its continued vertical lines and inserted horizontals. We have wished to make this landmark the study of a beautiful and vigorous form, not of an extraordinary form. Um, the, can I have the next, please? Uh, now, uh, in the scholarship of the reactions to the Chicago Tribune uh, competition, um, both at the time and also when I was in graduate school studying art history, uh, this uh, entry, the second prize winner by Elil Saarinen, the Finnish architect, uh, was much more highly praised um, for for being stylist for be, uh, and therefore moving be more progressive, moving toor more towards uh, establishing a modern style rather than a historical dress for the skyscraper. So it received a great deal of um, 
of attention um, and praise by the critics. Um, indeed, Hood uh, opined on it and said he found it an extremely uh, beautiful form and particularly liked the drawing style of Saarinen, as, as so many others um, praised the, the, de the great delicacy of the line. Um, the next, please. Uh, and it, it was all one thing too, just exactly like the description um, that I uh, that I read of Hood's uh, description of his own design. And I think that if you look at the drawings, the, some of the preparatory d drawings survive uh, in the Archives of American Art, uh, in Hood's sketches, and you can see uh, in the early sketches the sense that this is um, so one organic form, something that seems to be uh, sculpted perhaps um, because it's more abstract at the base and it so more breaks out into ornament uh, towards the spire. Um, the next please. Uh, but you can see that sort of um, fundamental idea that this is one tower rising in an express in a in a in, a, in an expressed vertical that then uh, then carries some of the detail, some of the um, ornament um, into a kind of elegance and upward aspiring, pointing to the sky as the, uh, we always describe uh, Gothic spires. Uh, so it uses a, a language of Gothic to seem appropriate in its in its delicacy, um, in its aspiration, but it's the it's the strength of the tower um, that seems to describe the uh, the, the office building below uh, that makes this a, a functional uh, building uh, as much as it does um, one of of, uh, of artistry. The next, please. Um, more of Hood's drawings, and you can see his um, you know, drawings in pencil is a, a very delicate hand, so he um, clearly uh, could uh could draw um, extremely well, trained in the, the Beaux-Arts uh, manner, uh, and, but you'll, we'll also see later how he rejects drawing as a, as a design method and takes to modeling and, and, and sculpting uh, in clay and in plaster. So he had the ability and the facility um, to, uh, to draw as well as any architect of the day, um, but he chose not to and he chose this more sculptural uh, approach. The next please. So the tower, just to look at some um, some clean uh, images of the the masonry facade, uh, but you can see how the verticalism is all so very strongly expressed, and the uh, the, the setback, slight slight recession of the windows, so that they're treated in a band, uh, is. Uh, a, a, a particular point of attention that Hood will use in the American Radiator Building next, and um, uh, and we can have the next image too, uh, and um, in, uh, in the, and then in all of the work uh, in this, not a Hood drawing, but. Uh, a, a, a document, uh, a book that was compiled by Edward Hoke on masterpieces of uh, American architecture. Uh, you can see, uh, interesting how you can, the, sectionally the, the building breaks away, so those uh, top, more, more ornamental floors are all usable space, uh, but you, could all, you can also see how the, uh, or you can imagine here at least how the, the floor plans all uh, um, create the highest quality space around the central um, elevator core. The next please. So this very four square upright tower um, is um, an ex the expression of uh, beauty that uh, that won him the commission and that um, that Hood writes about um, in his expression in his um, sort of testament to the idea uh, of the tower being the appropriate form for the skyscraper. Um, he gets the opportunity, the next place, to explore this um, in a commission, uh, well here we see some details, um, they're rather confusing, but uh, uh, the, st the carved stonework of the lobby you can see um, looks a little bit more like a chapel than a skyscraper, but these are some of the um, Tribune's um, ground floor entrance lobby uh, church-like details. The next please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so his his next commission in 1923. 
Um, so even before the Tribune Tower starts to rise, because it's finished in 1925, they get the commission and they and the $50,000 prize, of which $10,000 is shared um, by Howells with Hood, and that's $10,000 that he owed uh, to people and sort of kept uh, kept them um, eating and kept them going. Uh, but the key to winning was the fame that came along with this um, celebrated. Uh, uh, competition and commission. Uh, and uh, very quickly, clients began to pursue him. And a client that he had worked for only with some renovation of interiors was the American Standard Company, which is also called the American Radiator Company. They still make plumbing and advertise um, that. Um, uh, and this was their headquarters building on Bryant Park at 40 West 40th. Um, and you can see here next to it the, the typical kind of tower. In fact, it's by Eli Jacques Kahn, the Engineers Club, um, and, there's, and also the Explorers Club. Just a, um, a, a street facade rising straight up, cut off, a little classical um, uh, sort of graphic details um, on the facade. Uh, but it's, it's what, they, what architects called um, the sort of street front architecture, just a, just a wall straight up from the street, sort of like, um, like wallpaper um, that was, was stretched up. Um, Hood's building, by contrast, it takes the tower form and it's extremely three-dimensional. And this was the clear impetus, the design impetus um, in his concept that we'll see in a series of, uh, of sketches and models. Uh, the other thing about it, of course, uh, that was seen especially as, as uh, a symbol of modernity is the illuminated top, uh, the next please, which was uh, uh, draw, which was painted by Georgia O'Keeffe um, as a symbol of the new architecture in New York. This is a painting of, of uh, 1927. Uh, but you see in her painting something that's of interest and something that um, concerned Hood very much, and you, you saw in the last slide. Uh, it's the interior of the building shining out. It's the, le it's the late night work um, of the office space um, that, that um, breaks up the massiveness, that um, destroys the monolith uh, of the stony black building, uh, and instead the light um, sort of uh, um, breaks through, penetrates, turns it into a perforated form. Um, the next please. And that's um, exactly what Hood was trying to um, to overcome uh, in his design. And uh, when we see it during the daylight um, in slides in a moment, you'll see the black brick. Um, that's the, the, uh, the um, particular characteristic, the American Radiator Building, and then the gold detail on the uh, tops of the, the terracotta, the, the finials, and this, the rather gothic ornament. Um, and this contrast of black and gold uh, has been described in a number of ways um, Sometimes like the burning embers on top of the coal, um, like in the furnaces of the American radiator um, uh, sort of equipment that they, they sold. Hood himself referred to the Gothic architecture of Brussels um, and the black, um, actually soot black because it was blackened by um, pollution, but the Gothic architecture and then gold details. Um, so you can, you can see the continuing uh, sort of vehicle of, of Gothic to express height and, and to express literally towering height um, in what was really a, a fairly small building, only 23 stories. Um, but the thing that turns this building um, into a tower is what you can see in this small massing model, and we'll see, we'll see in others. Uh, the, the buildings that you saw, the street front facades, are um, adjacent there. The building sits on a rather large plot, uh, but then all of this space that, that could have been used straight up to the, to the lot line, and so would have been a continuous wall overlooking the park, instead is pulled away from either side and the tower stretches up in the center. So the, the, um, in a mid-block location, um, like with Corbett's Bush building that was already finished at this time, it had been built in 1917, um, you have uh, the unusual situation of the architect convincing a client uh, to um, pull the building away from the sides to forego some of the available space and to turn um, the, the uh, and turn the form into a tower. And um, Hood, um, Hood wrote about that. Can I have the next image, please? 
and these uh, the plaster studies uh, that were in Hood's office, and he used these. Uh, he used a massing study, then a. a, a, a Eighth, um, eighth scale um, model, then a quarter scale, and then a half scale. And he used these plaster models and also clay ones later uh, in the design process before any drawings were made. He made the drawings at the end of the process uh, after, after these details were being sculpted in, in, um, in uh, well, were being sculpted in, in solid form. Uh, and then the architectural uh, drawings, um, often to full scale, were done as a last stage, rather than using the Beaux-Arts method of, of sketching first. So he takes this sculptural method. Uh, he wrote um, of explaining how he had uh, convinced his uh, enlightened clients, the businessmen clients, American Radiator, uh, to, uh, to take his advice and turn a tower. He said, throwing away 16 feet of valuable available frontage is a thing that any real estate agent can demolish by a thousand financial reasons. But this particular, in this particular interest, in, instance, the deed was done before they knew it. Um, he, he, uh, he, a little bit, as I said before, sort of outsmarted his clients, or he used what's more accurate, I think, um, a business logic to sell them on the idea. And in this case, the, um, the idea, his idea was creating a tower, because towers are beautiful. Uh, but the, logic, the business logic of it was pulling the tower away from uh, the adjacent walls so that the next place, um, every side of the building could get good quality light. Uh, and so when you see it from the back side of the block, from the 40th Street side, you can see um, the um, setbacks who were sort of disguised. He didn't like set setbacks. He liked this, um, this straight shaft of a tower. Uh, and um, from uh, straight up on, on 40th Street, you get that rising form. The, the, the rest of it, the setbacks are hidden, but you can see that it's pulled away on either side from the, the lot lines so that all, all the way around on all four sides, um, each one of the offices it has a window that illuminates the, the space, not just from one side or the, uh, from the front side or the back side. The next, please. And here's the tower um, with its uh, gold terracotta ornament, which as you uh, see at the top is rather, um, rather generalized and abstracted. It has a, certainly the building has a Gothic feel to it in the this, this sense that it sort of scales up, in, but in a lot less literal way than the Chicago Tribune. Uh, and the next place, and on the, the ground level, there's this rather, well, we'll see it in, in very vibrant polychrome. Uh, let's go forward one and see the, the colored um, uh, gold terracotta uh, carved forms. I, um, I, I don't know of anybody who um, has uh, parsed out what Hood might have designed and what other people in the office uh, did. I, I seriously doubt that these were by Hood, but I think the overall sensibility uh, uh, and the, the more abstract character of the ornament is, is Hood's. But you can see that there is a you know, rather riotous mix of uh, figurative work of a, 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 a kind of um, uh, corbelled uh, um, uh, bas relief that is, um, you know, is, is much more historical, but at the same time isn't very specific in any any style. The next, please. Uh, and this is this is more detail, um, and we're, this ha has a kind of Gothic finial quality to it. It looks a little bit metallic, um, but it also looks a little bit like a tower. And I wanted to draw that analogy. I think with the next slide. Uh, uh, in a series of investigations that Hood um, did in 1924 um, and 25. 26 and really through 27 when he explored in a, in a series of uh, drawings but then also in a series of, of publications this idea of uh, tower buildings on wide streets and the idea of a, of a city of towers. Uh, this one is more of a visionary character, although there seems to have been some kind of uh, talk, a general discussion about a client that might have been General Electric uh, or one of the other um, energy or, le or 
lighting companies uh, for a, a building that was written up in some of the architectural magazines and sort of the gossip columns called the Electric Tower. And this seems to have been a sketch for an electric tower. There's another one that I showed in an exhibition that, that I did a long, long time ago on, on Hood that had written in the center there, Mazda Lamps. Uh, and this seems to be for a site that was discussed um, at the, uh, where the, the New York Central building is at the uh, base of Park Avenue at, at Grant Central. Uh, that site hadn't been um, developed at the time. This tower, as you can see from some of the benchmarks there, was to have been either 12 or 1400 feet uh, tall, which would have been by far um, the tallest building um, in the world at the time. The next, please. So, um, so you can see the, uh, the slightly gothicizing quality of it. It's as if one of his uh, gothic towers, Chicago Tribune or American uh, Standard, had been stretched way, way out on taffy and then, and then all of its, its um, sort of curlicue ornament uh, um, breaks out at the top. Uh, and in 1924, Hood uh, is uh, quoted at great length in this particular article by, written by uh, uh, a colleague in his circle and a good friend of Hugh Ferris's, Oreg Johns. Uh, and this, which you can't read there, it says, um, City of Needles, according to an idea uh, by uh, Raymond Hood and is rendered by Hugh Ferris. And there you see a kind of version, it seems to be it's, a, it's on a round base like this electric tower. These are towers that are supposed to be about 1,200 feet tall. Uh, they look a little like asparagus in a field. They're so <laughs> tall and, and, and thin. Uh, but you can see that they're also connected by uh, fast moving arteries um, filled with uh, high speed cars. Uh, but there's, they stand in the sunlight and each one's separated. And this idea of the city of towers connected by upper level bridges and, and, um, and multi-level highways uh, is something that we see throughout the exhibition but is generally communicated communicated as uh, these giant setback towers with full block bases so that they cover a New York City block. Um, these instead are point towers um, and they stand um, e each one separate uh, in full, full sunlight. The next please. And he advocated for this idea um, in, his, uh, uh, in his interviews in, uh, in this particular article and in, in a series of articles that he authored himself in 1926. Um, it's a closer view of the drawing. The next, please. Uh, so th uh, this is th this is the other version of what one um, expects to see, and we looked at it in the lecture series um, before, the setback towers here on a full block site uh, that were rendered as the four stages by uh, Hugh Ferris, and um, this is early as 19, 1922, um, seen as a, a city that's growing up according to the templates that, that's established by the 1916 zoning law. The next, please. So this is not what Hood um, was interested in, uh, nor was this kind of vernacular that uh, developed in the commercial architecture of the day, and so in the late 1920s, uh, n nor was that what Hood aspired to um, in his buildings. And he, uh, in each commission, tried to turn the setback into a tower. The next, please. The same idea as the City of Needles um, returns in a 1926 article written by Hood himself um, called The New York Skyline Will Climb Much Higher. And here um, the buildings are, not, are no longer sort of apparent masonry, um, but they seem now to be glass. So they seem to um, glow from within. And in the typical Hugh Ferris uh, uh, dramatization uh, with searchlights and, um, and sort of glinting faceted architecture. They seem more crystalline um, than lithic. The next, please. Uh, and as part of um, part of this same article in um, interior, in a, in a rather sad um, little sketch that is never monumentalized in any other version that I, I've ever found in, in Hood's writings, there's uh, this um, very suggestive idea uh, called the city uh, city of trees or buildings like trees. So the asparagus, I think, isn't too far off. Um, there's a kind of organic uh, quality um, to them, but uh, you know, once again, they're they're point towers and each one's separated by, um, by space and by transportation. Now, the next, please. The, the same idea 
he explores in um, a much more urban uh, context in an article that appeared in, in several different places in the architectural, uh, architectural Forum and in the American Architect and in a British journal too. Um, and this is called, uh, often called the, C the City of Towers. Um, the, um, well, actually, there, there are a couple more, uh, I think, um, fairly eloquent descriptions of the, the pinnacle city that I think are worth reading and sort of getting under our belts in order to get inside of, of um, Hood's head. So um, if, um, Emma, why don't you go back to the um, City of Needles one, or, yeah, that, that's good, that's good. Um, so he wrote, suppose that Manhattan Island were to be dotted with towers, a thousand or fifteen hundred feet tall, a forest of towers, of spires of commerce, 500 feet apart. Between them, broad spaces, parks where workers can find rest and recreation, shade, peace, and where there will be wide avenues with light traffic. On the first level, below the surface, will be our great stores. Bad weather would have no effect on business. Blizzards that now paralyze the city would be scoffed at. On one level, on the lower level, we'd have our rapid transit. So these aren't visible in the city, just the, the cars at, at, um, on the ground plane. Uh, the subways or the tubes. And on this level, there would be commodious sidewalks for pedestrians and splendid thoroughfares for high-speed motor cars. We shall, of course, be using air transport um, as, we now tr as we now travel in motor cars. Great landing stages will be provided for the lighter than air conveyances and the city of towers will be, there will be ample room for landing fields on, ground, on the ground for airplanes. Uh, and he says, inasmuch as there are no argument um, that something will have to be done, this scheme of a city of towers would have the desired effect of giving us sunlight, fresh air, parks, recreation, and parking space, and four times, at least four times, the present space for traffic. Um, and solving that problem of traffic becomes um, the, the key idea, and let's go forward now to the um, images of um, the um, urban scheme that are really applied in New York, where he takes the, um, the, the business motive and sort of the capitalist impulse and argues that um, New York, as it's rebuilding itself in the next sort of levels of skyscraper development as the either five, five or six story walk up um, brownstones are replaced by taller towers or here are the mid-rise commercial buildings of the uh, late 19th or early 20th century um, give way to skyscrapers. He says, um, let's, let's not use that um, sort of dark and cavernous model of the zoning, of the setback zoning law with its, um, its precipices, like mountains and precipices. Um, let's open up the city to the sunshine and let's, cre let's create a new formula. And he, um, he offers something that's very much like the FAR that would be introduced not until 1961 into our zoning law. So not a, not a setback according to an angle of light, um, but a formula based on frontage that he offered um, that was for every one foot of fr frontage you were supposed to get 500 extra square feet of, of um, space that you could pile up into a tower. So it was like a zoning bonus. It was like a floor area ratio that we would get um, another about 50 years later than he was proposing it. And he says that, you know, as um, each, as uh, um, owners and developers uh, begin to assemble uh, land parcels for a lot. Um, it's going to be in their interest um, to pull back away from uh, the street line, to open up more area of circulation for traffic, uh, and to pile their commercial space and their rentable space um, into tall, tall towers. Um, the next please, and so you can see in his own handwriting as he, he prescribes how this might um, be done. Uh, and um, there's his office in the American Standard Building. He signs up at the at the very top. Uh, and so here, so on a, a single New York block, uh, as it becomes uh, modernized, he imagines that the 600 or 800 foot block. Um, between avenues and the 200 feet between cross streets would be um, completely renewed um, and reinvented through this this point support um, this point tower uh, where circulation around uh, the bases is unfortunately not public plaza space but would have been given over to more, more to vehicular traffic. Um, the next please. 
and the formula they says there's you see the typical street plan and how it would look once um, his suggestion for incentivizing towers over setbacks was adopted. Um, next, please. Uh, and here's the article from the American Architect, and um, he wrote about this. Which, so the, he, these are in his own words what I just described. Um, suppose, for example, that municipal regulation were made establishing the volume and qu consequently the floor area at 500 feet for each foot of frontage, a basis that if all buildings in the city were developed accordingly, the existing streets would be sufficient to handle resulting traffic. Such a law would be no more of an abridgment of property rights than the present zoning laws, height restrictions, restrictions or rear yard requirements. In this new plan um, provided, um, the developer sets his buildings far back, uh, far enough back from the street and the property owner can build almost double the volume and produce double the rental returns. We now have made it in the interest of the property owner to widen the street at no cost to the city. It's to his advantage to give the city the part of his own land to prevent the congestion of which his own building is the chief cause. Um, the next place. And this is a very much um, a, a response to the current debate that we've di we discussed. Um, for those of you who were here for the, the Corbett lecture, Corbett was um, obsessed by the idea of, of traffic in the city and solving that problem, which he proposed be solved with multiple levels that separated uh, transit, wheels, uh, vehicles, and pedestrians on a level above. Uh, and that he proposed in many, many drawings, and to a large extent um, at Rockefeller Center became the system that was, uh, that was used in, in the first design. Um, we've seen before the model version, the 3D version of, of this um, same idea that you saw in the series of drawings. Um, the next, please. Now, by contrast, the European idea of, um, of reinventing the modern city is probably most famously advanced by Le Corbusier in, um, in a series of uh, polemical works that he, uh, he wrote and most importantly illustrated uh, in 1922 and in 1925 and then again through the, through the 1920s. Uh, so the Plan Voisin, the, the city for, for um, for um, two million people, the, the Ville Contemporaine, then the Plan Voisin, uh, 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 all advanced the idea of the separate zones of residential space um, surrounding in swaths uh, the at lower rise, uh, a nucleus of towers, of these cruciform towers that would be the office space, uh, the commercial space of the city. And of course, this is for a reinvented Paris. There's the Ile de, um, Ile de la Cité, Ile, de, Ile Saint Louis. Uh, and um, you knock down the Louvre, you knock down all of the historic <laughs> Cartier of Paris, and you put up gleaming glass towers and, um, and uh, spread uh, sunlit uh, low-rise housing blocks and parks and factories um, extended in, in zones beyond uh, with a landing strip in the very center for um, the same concern that airplanes be uh, able to conveniently deliver their businessmen to the, to the central city. Um, this idea has often been argued was the influence over uh, uh, Hood's, idea, Hood's own thinking about the, the, the city of towers, the American version of the city of towers, but I think you can see very clearly how utterly different it is in its, in its inspiration as well as in its style. Uh, later in 1929, Hood will take over some of the cruciform shapes and in, a, in a, uh, an article in, in Nation's Business, he seems to be influenced stylistically by some of the ideas of European modernism. But what's so clear um, in the other drawings, in their style, in their consistent evolution of the concern of the tower, in the problems of traffic, in the response to the problems of the modern city that Hood articulates are, the, are the, the, the problems that he's trying to solve through his architecture, that, it, that um, Hood's ideas come out of the city of New York, its congestion, the problem generically of the modern city, of the automobile, of the skyscraper, and are not a polemical response to um, ideas about how a modern architecture and a, and a socialist society can reinvent uh, a society through, uh, through, arch through new architectural forms, as was the idea of Le Corbusier. The next, please. 
So here's Hood in his um, somewhat split um, personality between, between being the architect uh, of the metropolis, um, of uh, as he the architect of congestion, um, he famously um, professed on um, many occasions in ar architectural debates on panels that congestion is good. Uh, and like Corbett, who argued uh, that though solving the problems of, of uh, traffic flow was one of the principal uh, issues that architects needed to confront, um, the the idea that um, that the activity of the city that it's energy uh, is something that uh, that the architects valued and that uh, you know as, as we've um, been been reading uh, we've been thinking about hood and reading what other people uh, wrote he um, he thrived on that energy he was ultimately uh, the an architect architect uh, who, who who loved congestion who celebrated uh, the intensity of the city but he lived in Stanford Connecticut and the ha and the next place in the house that he there he, there he is at his mansion he commuted in every day and when he built himself his own castle um, uh, he, he built um, this um, rather pastoral and um, and uh, um, perhaps sort of you know English country uh, style uh, uh, garden type uh, abode the next place and um, and his um, his stylistic expression was was not entirely consistent even as he made a, uh, an, an argument about modernism uh, when he received the commission for the London headquarters of the American Radiator Company which is called the National Radiator Company in London um, he designed this black um, I guess it's a basalt um, uh, building so it's a, it's, it's a very um, tight, taut um, po and polished skin with uh, rather elaborate art deco ornaments um, in the freeze zone at the cornice and um, also at the entrances the next place. Uh, it's um, often observed uh, that, it's, that, that this design seems to follow the inspiration of uh, Adolf Loos from the, his 1922 uh, competition for the American Radiator Building, and I don't know if I subscribe to that or not, but um, I figured it was at least worth um, showing, uh, again, uh, Lowe's amusing uh, entry. The next, please. Um, so, uh, so that kind of uh, Art Deco uh, ornament um, seems to be uh, inconsistent with the, uh, the, the, the professed um, Love of, of integral ornament and the and the organic nature of Gothic that Hood was uh, describing in his his early uh, commissions in that you know Gothicizing style. Um, so so Hood belonged to the uh, Beaux Arts Institute of Design. He partied with the American uh, group uh, of Beaux Arts architects at their annual balls. He uh, discussed. The, the modern style in the uh, forums that were presented at the uh, at Macy's and the Allied Arts Forum. He exhibited this work at the Machine Age uh, Exposition in 1927. He, he seems to um, to sort of fall um, very much within the the fashionable uh, um, zone, kind of ribbon of uh, of Art Deco that was being embroidered on buildings. Um, in this era, and was uh, certainly the the um, typical work of his good friends, uh, especially Eli Jacques Kahn. Um, the next place. So, so he seems to be an Art Deco architect, and um, he does uh, a, a number of commissions. This one is for Joseph Patterson, who be, uh, is the uh, his great uh, patron for the. Uh, the Daily News building. Uh, it's on, um, on uh, just off Fifth Avenue on 84th Street, uh, a, an apartment tower that has uh, a very um, spare and localized zones of Art Deco ornament and a kind of pinkish um, terracotta. Uh, but no great shakes, um, and you know nothing. The next place that would um, th that marks. Hood as um, an, an, ar an architect on the uh, of, of great invention and on the edge, um, but but Hood was was great, especially when he had great clients, um, and so. Uh, uh, Joseph Medill Patterson, um, that who you see here, was a cousin of McCormick, the Chicago Tribune uh, 
uh, newspaper, and he's reading his own uh, daily news tabloid there, the next place. Uh, he had in 1928 to 30 um, invited Hood to be the architect of his own house, uh, in a country house uh, in Connecticut, where um, a quite radically uh, spare, and one, and one can't call it international style modern, but a highly um, reduced, abstracted, modernistic form was what he chose. Um, but he, he described it as something um, that was without style. He said, I wanted the building to disappear into the landscape. Uh, and when he, when he had the commission, when he came to Hood for uh, the commission for the daily News building, he said, "Build me a factory." And it was um, it was Hood's um, uh, ambition and his uh, business acumen again that turned the factory uh, into a tower, and that tower into one of the great statements of uh, modernistic design uh, of uh, skyscrapers in, in New York or anywhere. Um, and you can see in contrast to the uh, also contemporary rising Chrysler building that this uh, that the Daily News is so um, so reductive, um, so angular, so geometric compared to the piled up boxes and the um, surface weaving of patterns and then the, the sort of efflorescent uh, uh, Ornament of the of the metallic crown of the Chrysler Building. So it seems so Chrysler Building, even though um, it's uh, taller and more monumental, seems somewhat seemed almost toy-like compared to um, this this sharp uh, abstracted form of just the bold stripes, the black and white of the Daily News Building. The next, please. Uh, and when you see it looking across in its context, 42nd Street by Grand Central, um, in, it, it, with the background, the Tudor City um, towers rising up rather like um, historic uh, um, attenuated French chateau, uh, you see uh, again how, how, how bold those um, straight stripes are. And they were, they were much commented upon um, at the time by critics. Uh, um, even Frank Lloyd Wright, who actually liked this building, Things, um, talked about how it seemed like he just the, uh, that Hood had just rolled the newspaper columns, the 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 the, um, the the rolls of paper straight up, and then just cut it off clean. That, that was that was a gesture which was um, so dramatically different than any of the of his contemporaries. The next, please. Uh, and you see in his sketches the analysis of um, floor areas um, of the um, plan and the elevator core of the massing um, and the, the setbacks that were required by the zoning law. Um, and then the next please, and then you, and all of these calculations were part of his design process and his discussion with his client who wanted um, a six story uh, printing plant um, on, on East 42nd Street. Uh, and he needed a little office space, so Hood convinced him, and Walter Killam um, narrates all of this because he was in the office at the time and he went to a lot of the meetings. Uh, and he, he um, Killam describes how cagey uh, Hood was in um, the steps of the uh, debate or the argument in convincing uh, Patterson to do a tower and said, said, well, you need some office space, so why not put a tower on top of that? So you have the, um, the production plant in the back um, stretching over to the east and on the back side of the building because you went all the way through the block, and then you'll put a tower on there. But you know, as long as you're doing a tower, you might as well get a little rental space out of it. So you know, let's make it a little bit taller. Uh, and once uh, once the, the tower was established as a, a money maker, as a revenue producer, um, then we could stretch the tower out a little bit, but that was going to be adjacent to another lot. So this alleyway that's a cut, cut through is a, a, an easement that was sacrificed by, um, by the Daily News in order to make a, an alleyway there, but that allowed um, this lot line to have windows on it rather than to, um, to be a blank wall. So just as he had done with the American Radiator building, he, he pulled the building um, away from its lot lines and, and stretched a tower up um, through the center so that the building would stand free uh, in space and have windows that looked out on all four sides would be illuminated by daylight as all buildings um, in, in the 1930s depended on daylight for, uh, 
to illuminate the workspace. Um, and in this series of, of office photos that were taken by Killam, you can see, and we'll see them in more detail, um, the steps of the um, carving, the literal, literal carving of the zoning envelope, shaving it down into the sculptural form so that the expression of a sheer vertical tower um, it, um, emerges from uh, the, um, the, the larger um, opportunities um, on the site that these, uh, the zoning law would have allowed. The next please, you can see that in con so, so here is the actual clay block or the plasticine that they used in the, the office uh, in order to describe what the maximum amount of space uh, was that the zoning law would have allowed on the site. Uh, and then as, as Killam um, writes about uh, how uh, Hood came in and other people were, prepar were preparing this model and, and, um, he, and Hood comes in and he takes a knife and the next one please, uh, he, uh, uh, this is, so that zoning law is like the Hugh Ferris drawings that we've now seen on a number of, of, of occasions. The next place. Uh, and um, with, with that block of clay, he takes the knife and he shaves it down uh, in order to create one um, flat rise uh, and then a, a couple of setbacks here. Um, eventually he did get, uh, there's one setback in the, in the actual building and then the tower rises sheer um, on, this, on the 42nd Street side um, and sheer on the sides. And as, as Killam um, wrote, he said, uh, I was, you know, I was completely astonished that, uh, you know, after all the, the uh, discussion about convincing the client uh, to make more space, that he was just, that he was slicing away rentable space, but he was doing it in order to create a tower form and, and Killam said, you know, the, the way architects speak of design that he said in that moment with the, with the knife, the, the, um, the concept had arrived, the, the, building, the building design had arrived. The next please. Um, and there you see the tower in a, in a plaster model with its um, alleyway that allows the, the tower to pull back and to have uh, windows. You can see the small puncture um, holes indicating the, the fenestration around on every side. And on the side that you don't see, the, the, um, the back side of the building, um, the space is maximized and the, the um, angle of light of the zoning law is followed in that series of setbacks, but that's completely disguised on the, mat, on the front side, the 42nd Street entrance. Next please. Um, also the, the, um, the bold stripes, um, uh, glazed uh, brick was of course not at all un uncommon. Um, glazed terracotta had been used on, the, on many buildings but one need only think of the Woolworth uh, Tower. Uh, colored uh, brick uh, as Highlights was also fairly common, and we'd seen we saw the black uh, brick of the American Radiator. That was um, unusual at the time. Black brick was only used in the early 1920s as a kind of um, highlight, um, as a, as, a, a gra as an ornamental graphic uh, motif, uh, and. Um, Brick was more usually beige or, or red color. Um, here the white glazed brick, um, some people think of it as the, the rolls of paper or the columns of, of the newspaper, are used in contrast with these recessive spandrels that are in red brick and black. Uh, and just a geometric motif so that in between and set back um, uh, behind the the, uh, the, the vertical piers, you get the, um, the next place, uh, this strong um, sense of, you can see a little bit of the color here, of a, a slight uh, red tinge and black so that the white really stands out, um, it emerges from the surface, um, and the, um, the stripes then uh, disguise the, the windows so they don't look like the puncture holes, they look like continuous bands. The next place. Uh, but the Art Deco-ish part of the uh, building is its base where the sculptural program um, um, proclaims the, the title of the paper, the name of the paper, the news, um, and then has um, uh, modern bas-relief sculpture and allusions to Abraham Lincoln, the common people. He made so many of them, as they said. The next, please. 
uh, the dramatic interior with the globe, that, that touch of theatricality is something that one finds continuously uh, in Hood. And so one enters the simplicity of the street into this dome space of black glass with a, a, a globe at the center illuminated from below, so it seems rather to float. Um, the outside um, ring of metal also uh, reflects the light and, it, and um, gets absorbed by the, the, the the darkness uh, of the black glass, but also the facets that give it a little bit of a, like a jewel-like or crystalline um, glint. The next, please. Uh, and the Hugh Ferris rendering, um, emphasizing its, both its whiteness and its verticality. The next, please. Uh, the stripes go the other way in the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design. And just to show you um, some um, other uh, projects and to emphasize his connection to his, uh, you know, his, his love of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts uh, and his connection to that community of architects. Uh, this was a, a program uh, of uh, um, pied-à-terre of, uh, and with a developer, which was done in cooperation with Kenneth, Kenneth Murchison, another architect who was also a developer. So they invested money in this site and each one of the uh, little townhouses, the Maisonette and then the little pied-à-terre studios uh, were um, created uh, as a, um, a kind of studio or overnight um, space for people who lived like Hood did in, in uh, Stanford, Connecticut, and you know wanted to stay out, whatever, drinking late at night or whatever. Um, the the Beaux Arts uh, apartments were for that kind of, of uh, lifestyle. The next, please. I have quite a few images of them here. You can see that they they're rather loft-like in their bulkiness, as you see them. Um, in an aerial view. The next, please. Um, but um, they had um, full regalia, and so that's the doorman, like a gendarme, um, giving you, keeping you in the mood of uh, gay Paris. No, they're there. Mm -hmm. Next, please. <laughs> Uh, the the lobby um, there is some, some of the details to the lobby not the furniture exists um, any longer and it's a, a kind of India red um, mixed in in black veining the next please uh, and a, a rare view of the interior that I've gotten from a, a very small um, illustration in one of the magazines uh, so, um, the space is divided up into um, several levels in order to make it seem, um, I guess, larger by its change of, of floor height. The next, please. Um, so I'm going to go very quickly now through the rest of these, but the um, visionary proposals um, during the same time that Hood was absorbed in the idea of, this, of street and congestion and, and advocating for towers, um, he also participated in this sort of uh, um, uh, to frothy visionary speculation that uh, Corbett and, uh, uh, and Ferris particularly illustrated um, as Ferris drew the idea for bridge homes that were discussed in this uh, article again by Oric Johns but uh, where Hood is widely quoted about uh, bridged communities that would have um, thousands of people um, that, were, that uh, occupied uh, chic apartments on the pylons of the bridges and then on the, um, the road bed uh, were lined with a kind of townhouses on either side. Um, the, I think the next please has another version of that. Bridge communities. Um, uh, from another, uh, a second Hugh Ferris drawing, um, but the, to an idea that he credits um, Hood with. And so here's a little bit about the bridge communities. Um, besides shops, the theaters and the broad esplanades where the bridge dwellers would meet, um, where they would meet. Another feature bringing them together would be the gardens on the roofs. They would run continuously the length of the bridges, intercommunicating by means of stairways, real gardens with grass and flowers and shrubbery and moonlight just as good as any to be had on land. <clears throat> Water sports would thrive. Facilities could easily be, pro be provided by descending by elevator to the water level, attired in bathing suits for the da daily dip. The complete equipment of the bridge citizen would include aquaplane and motorboat as well as prosaic automobile. These would be sheltered by arrangements under the bridge, garages beneath the main deck, suspended hangars, and anchorage for boats in the water. 
Each bridge would have its own churches, schools, shops, perhaps even a community theater. Rivalry would exist between them over the prowess of their respective inhabitants in art, in sport, and in civic usefulness. Um, the, um, uh, uh, the, the kind of lifestyle that he imagined for all the people who lived in the city doesn't go much below, I think the um, phrase he uses, um, brokers, bankers, and lawyers um, in one of, one of his other quotes. And you can imagine that this, is, uh, is a, this lavish lifestyle would have to be supported by um, very high rents, and especially for your aquaplane and all of that to you know, keep that um, parked um, conveniently. But, but this, this incredibly optimistic urbanism where uh, the, um, the riches and the technology of, uh, of the modern age invents lifestyles which are glamorous and convenient um, and, um, and um, possible um, within uh, the broad spectrum of uh, diversity that is, is New York is, uh, is a, a party line that, uh, that Hood um, writes about with, with really great relish. Uh, he says the lightness, simplicity, and lack of applied uh, verdict, verdict, and lack of a. Nope, excuse me, no, I'm in the wrong place. Go to the next place. That's right. Um, and th this idea that we've seen before, um, the multiplication of these bridge communities, there are at least two dozen of them here, um, were um, uh, drawn for exhibition uh, in 1930 at the Architectural League's uh, annual exhibition. Uh, and they combined with these uh, node centers of skyscraper um, interchanges uh, where zoning allowed um, the great uh, um, piling up of commercial space, the next please, um, over, uh, well, okay, more, more no, draw, the drawings of the bridge communities, I think the next one is the view down into the skyscraper centers, um, which is a drawing that we have in the exhibition and which became the frontispiece for a monograph in 1931 uh, written by Alfred North. Um, about Hood, um, so that this the idea of urbanism is, um, and towers is really central to understanding the man, uh, according to this kind of summary of his, his career to date in 1931. The next place. Uh, and so quickly, the, um, the idea of the city of the towers, he advances um, once again in 1929 in um, a, a typical um, forum for him, uh, the magazine called Nation's Business. And uh, here we have the, the cruciform towers that um, one might attribute the influence of Corbusier uh, being expressed here. And here you see just one block being carved out um, as, uh, as a... Um, cross-shaped tower takes over some of the, um, the existing city fabric. The next, please. Uh, and just to remind you what Corbusier was doing at that time, at the same time. The next, please. So um, uh, we'll talk next, the next week about Rockefeller Center. So I'll just preview um, briefly here Hood's own role, and then we'll look at it in much more detail. Um, in our hour next week, but an article that he wrote for the New York Times called The Hanging Gardens of New York, and uh, he makes the uh, analogy to the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, was one of the great ideas that Hood contributed to this project. And the gardens that you see on the rooftops are his idea. The next please. Um, and uh, he, here you see him with Wally Harrison, um, who uh, had joined the firm there, and um, uh, Reinhardt of uh, uh, Hoffmeister, uh, Reinhardt and Hoffmeister, uh, the uh, part of the Associated Architects of Rockefeller Center. They're sort of the, the belly of the building architects that did the floor plans. Um, and Hood was brought on really for the inspiration for uh, for m many of the ideas of the uh, of the overall plan, but especially for the central tower, the um, RCA building, and um, for the idea that he contributed of roof gardens. The next, please. And typically, the um, the roof the uh, roof gardens were something that he sold to his his client, who was of course John D. Rockefeller Jr., but had, who his emissary was uh, J.R. Todd, who was the project manager, the overall manager of the construction site. Um, the, we'll look at this uh, again later, but of course the great central tower, uh, now called 30 Rockefeller Center, but when it was the, the center of the, um, the deal, it was to be Radio City with the um, 
the uh, RCA headquarters and studios in, uh, occupying a, about a million square feet of the over two million square feet of space that was to be created. That was cut back by, um, by de the realities of the Depression, but they did um, become the, uh, a, a key tenant. Uh, and this centerpiece of the complex, which will turn 75 years uh, an uh, anniversary this year, and which we will uh, preview, we will celebrate on, um, uh, April, on May, Eighth, with a symposium with Daniel O'Krent, Hillary Ballin, um, and James Sanders, uh, and I think probably Bill Pedersen talking about uh, Rockefeller Center's urbanism and, and its uh, existence as a mega project. Um, anyway, this is, is this is its big year, and this is the um, 75th anniversary of of 30 Rock. The next, please. Um, so the only thing that I want to say about it um, at this point, you'll see a few pictures of the roof gardens um, because they fit into the visionary urbanism theme that, uh, that Huda, as we've seen, has been exploring in his writings throughout the 1920s. But what, what, um, the way that one experiences the RCA building, especially when you're on Fifth Avenue and you look through the Channel Gardens, um, you, uh, you, you see it on axis in a, in a bizarre way where you, you're commanding to stand in the, in the center space in order to properly experience the tower. So, you, so as you stand on Fifth Avenue in the middle of that block and you look straight up, you don't see any of the back uh, back of the building. You see none of its breadth be to, as it stretches back to Sixth Avenue. Instead, you see it as a tower, and it rises sheer. Um, straight up with a few setbacks that articulate uh, actually the elevator banks as they, they fall away. Uh, but um, you experience it as a sheer tower, as, as sheer and tall as those 1924 projects for um, the City of Needles. The next please. Um, and this other idea that Hood contributes of the uh, gardens on the rooftops he sells to the client Todd by saying, well, there's seven acres of roofs at, at uh, Rockefeller Center with all these different buildings. Now, Mr. Todd, you know, y y y y everything matters about the, the beauty of a building, and you know that, that buildings that are built over parks get higher rents than those that look on the backside, you know, tops of uh, water tanks and, uh, and uh, equipment uh, penthouses. So, you know, if this, if this building were to overlook a park, how much more rent do you think you could get for that space than um, if it were just um, ugly rooftops? And, and Todd, um, you know, thought and he answered a dollar a square foot. And, then, and Hood then argues, well, you've got seven acres of space um, of park space um, to be developed if you pay the extra like, million dollars for the roofs. Um, and it did, in a quick calculation of the square feet of interior space overlooking the roofs, um, he, uh, Todd was, was almost immediately convinced of the idea that a roof garden was not just viable, it could be profitable. Um, in the next place. And, and um, Killam, who was there at the time for the argument, said the next day the sculptors came in, the model makers came in, and they were, they were putting um, roof gardens over all of the buildings. And, and here you see Rene Chamblain's um, uh, clay foliage. The next place. So that idea of, of business and um, uh, commerce and culture um, being married in Hood's idea of, uh, of the tower, um, you, can, you see in all of his work. And in this last of his towers, the McGraw-Hill building, uh, the great um, mixed-use tower, not, uh, not an office building except at the top half, but like the Daily News, uh, a, a printing plant for the McGraw-Hill publication uh, with light manufacturing on the, the lower zones. Um, and the next, please. Um, a, a, a kind of factory aesthetic. I mean, this looks like a factory that's been stretched out. It doesn't look like an office building, but it doesn't look like a, 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 an office, a skyscraper office building. It's banded um, in the horizontal, which is unusual for Hood. You know, here he's contradicted himself completely from the orientation of the Daily News building. Uh, it's got casement windows like a, like a loft factory uh, that, um, that accentuate the horizontals, but also also make the building feel like it's um, a, like a volume of air, like um, it's uh, like there's a skin of glass enclosing uh, this um, in, 
a, a big lighted interior space and um, especially with the color this sea, sea foam green or the turquoise color um, also denying any kind of solidity or stony carved quality then <clears throat> the next please and so here you see the building going up where the cladding barely um, uh, looks any lighter than the open frame of the of the steel cage. So everything within a kind of airiness, um, a kind of um, lightness and spatial volume. The next, please. And this idea, and here it is in color. Um, and actually, the original color, uh, of course, the turquoise uh, of the terracotta. Much of it is still the original. There's there's been um, a lot of uh, facade work and replacement. Uh, but the windows have lost their original polychrome. They were an apple green, and they were on the on the inside. The reveals of the windows they were vermilion. So it was a, um, a red color contrasted with an apple green. The next, please. Um, and so that's what the um, the office space of the manufacturing plants, uh, clerical workers, looked like. The next, please. Uh, and what it looks like, uh, you know, as it's uh, overcome by some of the new residential towers on 42nd Street, and of course the Port Authority in the foreground. The next, please. Uh, and the great streamlined uh, metallic. Um, uh, sort of speed lines of uh, both the, the graphics of McGraw Hill, but also the lobby. The next place uh, is sort of the curvature of the lobby as these lines sort of shoot you into the interior space and have a, a kind of um, maybe automotive or um, at least uh, a kind of accelerated um, uh, quality to them. The next place, so that um, everything is, seems to be, uh, you know, sort of rushing you um, uh, into the, the main lobby space to the elevators and the, the spare um, nature of the, the decoration other than this, this linearity is something that um, seems to be character, uh, a characteristic of, of a very uh, contemporary 1929-1930 modernism. The next please. And, um, but with a kind of art deco uh, panache of uh, these rather um, heavy fixtures, but uh, and um, the love of polychrome, of course, which is also characteristic of um, late twenties uh, Art Deco inspired work. The next, please. So we're at we're we're at the end almost. Um, by 1929 and 1930, uh, clearly Hood was taking over some of the mannerisms of international style design. Uh, he, of course, went back and forth to France on, on, um, on regular trips. Uh, as long as he had the money he, and the, the time, he would uh, go off and see what's new in Paris. He attended the, the 1925 Expo. Uh, he uh, was absorbing some of the ideas in the literature of Le Corbusier. Walter Killam writes that he, he he lent uh, Hood his own copy of Vers in Architecture and, and um, Hood read it and then and gave it back to him. Uh, so we know that he absorbed a lot of those ideas. He must have been thinking about them. Uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't really he seems to be just sort of taking over the surface rather than completely comprehending the entire um, argument of, uh, of the polemical modernism of, uh, of leaders like the uh, Bauhaus, Mies van der Rohe and and Le Corbusier, who were shown in, uh, at the MoMA in 1932, the next place. Um, uh, so um, by contrast, uh, we'll, we'll go back in a minute, uh, he's, he's producing at the same time the commercial sort of branding architecture of the Rex Cole um, uh, refrigerator um, and uh, kitchen e equipment uh, showrooms that you see here in his more Art Deco style and go, now go back to the idea for a, a tower in the country which um, he imagined uh, being a um, a lifestyle that people who rather than wanted to take a country house but who wanted to you know, play golf and enjoy um, the fresh air of the countryside might uh, want to buy a kind of you know, proto condominium kind of a apartment tower and country, country towers. Um, I think I won't read that, I'll, I'll just go forward. But, uh, um, 
And, um, and he became involved in um, two big projects. One was the 1933 uh, Century of Progress, and this other is this terminal city, um, which didn't get any farther than this, than this drawing. The, the next, please. Um, where I want to leave him is with um, where we'll begin next time about the, um, the Rock, about Rockefeller Center. Um, because Hood's reputation, I think, is, is much um, summarized and exemplified through a project like Rockefeller Center that combines uh, real estate ambitions, um, cultural aspirations, um, urban vision uh, in terms of, of the scale of the project, uh, but a kind of um, commercial savvy that was absolutely necessary in order to make the whole thing work. Uh, and I'll just read the, the, um, the end of the chapter on Hood that I've written that I think um, sort of summarizes the argument as succinctly as I can. Um, said, uh, the phrase commercial architecture is not an oxymoron, um, as some sort of scholars of modernism or partisans of modernism and international style modernism um, denounced Hood for being too much of a commercial architect. Uh, skyscrapers uh, resist aesthetic experiments, but they do not preclude them as Hood's buildings show. His extraordinary accomplishment was to innovate within the narrow constraints of the type. Working within the market standards for first class interiors, he rejected the ubiquitous setback solutions and made towers that each had a strong individual identity. Hood understood skyscrapers as business propositions, and his urbanism was narrowly focused on, on the commercial center. But as early as 1924, as we've seen, he asserted his belief that Manhattan would become an exclusive enclave for business, commerce, and entertainment. Although his earliest visionary proposals were probably stimulated by a desire to share in the attention that Corbett and Ferris and others had generated, his interest in the subject grew through the 20s. Like Corbett, he saw the condition of the modern metropolis as the necessity of concentration. And, and, and still he observed, and this is his quote, this does not mean that the man becomes a mechanical robot, the slave to the machine and to society. He merely, it merely means that his workaday hours, this, in his workaday hours, the city, or rather the portion of the city where he works, must be planned to be efficient, convenient, and comfor comfortable through his purpose. The urban problems that Hood set out to solve were thus circumscribed. His proposals desi designed to concentrate population, decongest streets, and maximize density and efficiency. The skyscraper, specifically the tower, was his all-purpose solution. To realize his vision of the rationalized city, Hood stressed the logic of economics rather than the wonders of technology. Or, power, or the power of the master plan. Applied to Hood, the term visionary pragmatist was no more of a contradiction than the term commercial architecture. So that's what I think about Raymond Hood. <laughs> Thank you.